Recently, I was at a community event near me uh, speaking about responding to climate change as individuals. I had 20 minutes to speak, which, which if I'm honest, went very quickly. And the key message I was trying to get across was that in, as individuals, we can impact on our emissions in four areas in our own lives. How we heat, how we travel, the power that we use and the stuff that we consume. And without doing the whole talk again here, I was trying to share some high level themes saying that heat is the main challenge that we have and a tool that we can use is a heat pump, that travel is the next big challenge and if we should drive less, but if we have to drive, electric vehicles are a really good solution. The third thing is that electricity isn't really a problem in terms of emissions anymore and that we should try to consume less and eating less meat is a good step to take. I didn't go into loads of detail in that 20 minutes and we could talk about all, all the talk about these issues all day if we had the time. But at the end one of one session that I did, someone left the room saying, you didn't mention the grid. The grid can't handle it. Which to some extent is a fair point, but without some context and without some nuance. I didn't really get a chance to respond, so I thought I might do a video about it. So can the grid cope with what I am hoping for. Heat pumps eating homes, some of us driving electric vehicles. Well, let's think through that as a problem and let's talk through what is happening at the moment and what might need to happen over the next few years. So here's the problem. We, current get the, we currently get the majority of our energy uh, in the UK from fossil fuels. And hear what I say when I say energy. I'm not saying electricity. I'm saying energy more broadly. So energy delivered in the gas that we burn in heating systems or, or, the, or in petrol stations filling fuel tanks as we travel around. Today, three quarters of all energy in the UK is supplied to customers using fossil gas or oil. Only 17% of the UK energy demand is delivered in the form of electricity. Fossil fuels are an incredible resource because the energy stored in a small volume can be used to power things for a long time. They're essentially a really dense battery that was charged up over millions of years that we can dis discharge almost instantaneously. And the boiler and the internal combustion engine are really amazing bits of technology that, transform the, that transfer those little parcels of energy, burning that fuel to power us forward or to create heat. In response to climate change, we need to find a different way of delivering energy and without going into the detail of why we shouldn't use a different fuel for everything, the hydrogen word, and I'll link an article a little uh, below about that to discuss it more. Um, but the conclusion is that I and that many others have come to is that we should deliver that energy in a low carbon electricity system, generating electricity without burning fossil fuels, using electricity to charge batteries either as stationary storage or in electric vehicles, and using it to power heat pumps to provide the heat, to provide heat where we need it. Okay, so all the energy that we need for heating and transport delivered by electricity rather than by oil and gas. And this does come with a few challenges, so let's talk them through. Challenge number one, can we generate enough electricity? So to power all our vehicles and heating systems using electricity, we are going to need to generate more than we currently do. And that means we'll need significantly more electricity generation than we do today. So more wind turbine solar, solar panels, more ways of generating electricity. We need that more. And also we have a problem with renewable energy. It's not always sunny and it's not always windy. We need additional capacity to ensure that we can always generate enough. As well as additional storage to ensure that we can get through those dark and still times in the winter. So people have thought about this. The energy consultancy DNV predicts that that will mean that we need an additional 140 gigawatts of generation capacity by 2050, with 90% of that capacity being new wind and new solar. That is a huge increase in our generation capacity, and it is a challenge. But it's a challenge that we're already uh, filling with the construction of, of new generation assets all the time, such as new offshore wind, some new onshore wind, new solar farms across the country and with energy storage everywhere we go. And as we take time to tr transition to a low carbon energy system, we have the time to increase that capacity as well, as well as cleaning up the existing generation that we have today. 
potentially clean it up with a technology called carbon ca capture, which is a conversation for a different video. So we will need more electrical generation. So yes, I agree with the challenge. The grid isn't ready, but we have time to expand. And as much as I, I would like us to accelerate the transition to heat pumps and EVs, the changes are still slow. So we have time to pick up the slack. And one side note about a low carbon energy system is that it actually means it will use significantly less energy. The efficiency gains of electrification, both the several hundred percent efficiency of heat pumps, but also the efficiency of electric vehicles means that we'll use less energy overall. We need more generation, yes, but overall the energy demand is likely to drop as we move towards a fossil free system. Okay, okay, more generation capacity. But how do we get that capacity, uh, that electrical capacity to where it's needed? And this comes to challenge number two, uh, linked to the electricity grid. And it's already a challenge today. On a windy day, we have an oversupply of electricity in parts of the UK and bottlenecks in our electricity system so that we can't get that extra electricity to the parts of the UK that need it. This sometimes means that we turn off turbines, uh, what we call curt curtailment, wind turbines, and whilst we still burn gas in other places. So as we install more wind turbines and solar farms, often in remote or rural parts of the country, the problem is going to continue and it could get worse. But there are already projects underway to build that new electrical infrastructure to get the generation to where it needs to be. And that might look like new underwater cables off the coast of the UK to take generation north to south. It might mean new towers or pylons with electrical cables spreading across the land. It might mean repurposing or upgrading existing ones too. It could mean new buried cables so we don't see the new towers. And part of the work of the new UK organisation GB Energy seems to be to unlock this kind of new infrastructure to help deliver clean power where it is needed. And yeah, don't get me wrong, this is a massive challenge. But it seems something that the government is committed to. And again, with the time that we've got during the transition, it's a, it's a challenge that we can overcome. So that's the, the challenge on a macro scale, on, on the big scale, um, moving generation across hundreds of miles to where it's needed. But it's not the only challenge we have when it comes to the grid and to transmission of electricity. When we actually get to deliver the electricity where it's needed, are the local networks strong enough to deliver to local demand? And this is probably the third challenge linked to the grid that I'll talk about today. Let's use Durham City, where I live, as an example. So anecdotally, I understand that the primary substations, the bits of infrastructure that take the really high voltage electricity and make it more palatable for use at local level, those primary substations today are at capacity. So let's, uh, let's make up a figure. They were designed to supply, let's say 40 megawatts of electrical demand at most, and the city today, let's say, is using 38 megawatts of that capacity. To decarbonize heating and transport, we will be installing new electrical loads, so large heat pumps to heat large commercial buildings or education buildings, uh, small heat pumps to heat domestic properties, and chargers of different capacities, fast, super fast, hyper fast, if that even exists, to fill our cars as we need to. The new electrical load to facilitate this is definitely gonna push the city's infrastructure over the top, it's going to tip us over, over the top of capacity. So we will need new reinforced supplies, uh, new substations, transformers, all that stuff to facilitate decarbonisation. And that starts us down a bit of a route of asking a fair number of questions. So how big should that capacity be? How, should, how big should the new infrastructure be? When should we look to install it? Who should pay for it? So we, society, could probably estimate the peak electrical demand for, for a city like Durham if it was decarbonised. We could get data about peak gas flow and convert that to a certain amount of power delivered to the city. Uh, we could understand the amount of fuel sold at our forecourts and understand the amount of energy used by vehicles in this area. And with some assumptions and some maths, we could come up with an electrical capacity figure to decarbonise our neighbourhood, our city and the broader area. And with that number, our distribution network operator, our DNO, could then start designing the system to provide the power as required. But when should we install this new infrastructure? We aren't all getting EVs and heat pumps tomorrow, even though it would be great if we did. So what and when should infrastructure be built? 
And more importantly, when should money be invested? Well, we need to make some assumptions on the pace of the transition uh, and make some decisions that will facilitate progress, even if it's not the final story. We need that long-term strategic planning that would consider the end goal and deliver a path to get there. And I know that there are teams within Northern Power Grid working on this kind of planning, this kind of strategic long-term planning. And there is some investment in developing things called local area energy plants. I do worry that it's all a bit too slow and that big organizations wanting significant new electrical capacity will be jumping the gun a bit with Northern Power Grid not ready to supply it strategically. So DNOs, like Northern Power Grid, um, sometimes have a reputation um, as private profit-making companies. Um, Northern Power Grid, for example, is owned by Berkshire Hathaway, which is ultimately owned by the multi-billionaire Warren Buffett. Um, they have a reputation of not investing in advance of need. In fact, they, they may well be regulated to not invest in, in advance of need to keep costs down for consumers. I'm getting a little bit out of my area of expertise here, but a system trying to keep costs down to make a profit and without incentive to plan for the medium term isn't really what we need to deliver uh, on long-term decarbonization. So yeah, this is a problem. And to agree with that original challenge at some point in the medium term, yes, the grid can't handle it. I wonder if there already has been a heat pump or an electric vehicle charger refused or significantly delayed on a neighborhood uh, level, at that substation level, because of local infrastructure concerns. And if it hasn't been, I'm kind of certain it has been, if it hasn't been, I'm sure that's gonna to start to happen more and more as we continue to transition. I think something needs to change with our regional electrical distribution. And on top of that, the question comes, who's gonna pay for this new infrastructure? You may tell, you can by, by what I'm talking about, is that I think it's absurd that a monopoly that is a, a local DNO would be a profit-making company owned by one of the world's richest people. But that's the way things are today. And upgrades that are regulated, so regulated upgrades are paid for in part by our taxation, in part by our electricity bills, and in part by certain customers provoking that upgrade. There is potentially a large cost that will be added to electricity costs in the coming years. And that is a problem too. Okay, so that's, yeah, kind of capacity and uh, infrastructure problems kind of covered without much in terms of the solutions. So yes, the grid is a problem. And maybe again, the solution is we have time to solve the problem. So maybe one more challenge that maybe this next one is a little bit more rosy in how we could look at it. I've already mentioned that with a uh, fully decarbonized system on a windless and dark day, we potentially have a problem of not enough electricity. Renewable energy tends to be intermittent. And alongside some of the national projects I've already touched on, um, we are already working on solving this challenge. So for example, we already have interconnectors to our neighbors in Europe, both east and west of us and south of us. And this will allow us to share electricity on a windy day uh, in the North Sea when we've got too much or to receive electricity from Europe when we have too little, helping us keep powered despite the weather, the variation of weather in the UK. You can imagine this massive European-wide electricity grid that's taking sun, sunny, sunny weather from Spain to deliver where it's needed in the rest of Europe or windy weather in the North Sea to deliver to Spain. It, there's loads of different ways we could do that. And some of the challenges that we've had in the last year in, in our electricity systems have come when those interconnectors we already have have dropped out for various reasons or where they need maintenance. So there is still a problem with inter intermittency despite those interconnectors. So to solve that, we can build more capacity. Um, we may rely on peaking plants that could be gas in the short term, maybe gas with carbon capture or maybe another fuel in the future. And we will have to rely on battery storage. This means new grid scale battery storage, maybe traditional storage like pumped hydro uh, and potentially new novel energy storage like compressed air. We may also to, uh, be able to take advantage of other areas of the energy transition to help with intermittency. intermittency. So what role could batteries in electric vehicles play to help store energy? We already have 1.25 million electric vehicles on the road in the UK as of September 2024, according to ZapMap. And if we assume that the average battery for these vehicles is 40 kilowatt hours, that means today 
driving around the country, we have the potential of 50 gigawatt hours of stored electricity. Many of these vehicles already charge using what we call time of use tariffs, which would encourage charging overnight when there is spare capacity or when it's windy, um, shifting demand to take advantage of intermittency. And in the future, with chargers that could supply home, so, so bi-directional chargers as well, as, as take electricity to a vehicle, the so-called vehicle to grid, these vehicles could supply our homes with some stored energy when we're short on the national scale. Shifting the peaks away from the dark times and so from the still and dark times to supply that stored electricity from the windy and bright times. So intermittency will be a problem and it may mean that we struggle to get to completely zero emissions from the electricity grid in the short term. And we'll be able to get, we will be able to get to very low emissions. And as we deliver more electrification, transport and heat, we'll be able to have more flexibility to use the power when we have excess electricity so we can minimize power demand when we're struggling. So yes, this is a problem, but again, a problem not in the, the immediate future and one that we're planning to deal with. It's an engineering challenge that we can meet if we had sufficient desire to do it. I'm just going to throw in a side challenge uh, that could ha happen as we transition significantly away from fossil fuel infrastructure, which is the impact on the natural gas system, the fossil gas system. If a street of homes removed their gas boilers, but maybe one or two uh, didn't remove gas boilers, then who would be liable for the costs to maintain those supplies? At some point, a gas supply would become unviable to a community without significant increases to standing charges. And at some point, we'll need to reach a tipping point that forces the closure of gas infrastructure on a local and a regional level. Hopefully, that tipping point will happen when we're all ready for it. Okay, so there are a load of challenges with our energy system if we're going to transition away from fossil fuels to a clean energy system. I'm sure there are other challenges that I've not touched upon, but I hope you can see that we can have some technical optimism that the transition is achievable over a certain amount of time. And the challenge that the grid can't handle it is really oversimplified. Of course, the grid is a problem and a bottleneck, but not one that should stop individuals and organizations making decisions to move things forward. Reducing reliance on fossil infrastructure gives us a number of benefits. Cleaner air, reduced climate risk, potentially cheaper energy, sending less money to dodgy oil, dodgy oil and gas states. And it does cause a number of challenges but none that should slow us down in the short term. So don't be distracted. The grid can handle you making a decision to install a heat pump or an electric vehicle charger. It's not something that we as consumers need to worry about too much about in the short term or in the medium term. Maybe those developing strategy on behalf of big fossil fuel users, on the other hand, for them, maybe it is something to worry about. So what do you think? Do you see any other challenges that I've missed with the grid and getting to a low carbon economy? How would you approach those challenges? How would we overcome them? And what areas do you see optimism and opportunity when it comes to the grid? Thanks so much. See you next time.